You've tuned in to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes and Dr. Tara Lynn Sell. Your access to success strategies and more to help you move onward and upward with your life. Listen in each week as they interview others who have really taken their essence to the next level and truly unpause their life. Now here are your hosts, Dr. Kelly Estes and Dr. Tara Lynn Sell. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. This is Dr. Kelly Estes and I am founder of the Addictions Academy, the Addictions Coach and Rehab Rescue. Welcome to Unpause Your Life. This is a great podcast where we showcase people who have done something extraordinary with their life. I welcome you and I hope you enjoy all of our guests. On my way found a reason to wake up another day. But they needed to show You are listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Callie Estes of the Addictions Coach and the Addictions Academy and my lovely co host, <laughs> Dr. Tara Lynn from drterralyn.com. Our guest today is from Texas, so we're going to talk about the Cowboys, despite Dr. Tara's trepidation for them. Dr. Go Mary Godsey, an OBGYN and women's health expert. She is a renowned expert in women's health and board certified and active fellow of the American College of Gynecology. She graduated summa cum laude with a BA in psychology from Southern Methodist University in 2002. She went to Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, and she completed her residency in gynecology at George Washington University in Washington in 2010. She then practiced in Plano, Texas. Go Cowboys. I told you I'd work that in Go there. Pack. Go Pack. Go Pack. <laughs> <laughs> and she's been named a top doctor of Collin County by D Magazine. That's huge for those of you in Dallas. Welcome, Dr. Perry. Thank you, thank you. And now I actually, I've left Plano. Updated is I moved from Texas to LA about two years ago. And here I'm an OBGYN hospitalist, which I can explain what that is, but I work out here in LA in the Valley at Northridge Hospital. So. Ah, huh, okay. I got to ask you, my very first question is, why did you choose yeah. uh, gynecology? So, you know, it's, it's interesting because I always knew I wanted to be a doctor, but I didn't know what specialty I wanted to go into. I used to think I wanted to do some sort of pediatric subspecialty because that's what my uncle is, and he's a pediatric neurologist, and he was part of my inspiration to being a doctor. But when you go to medical school, you notice a divide. I think people either kind of fall into more medicine-based or more kind of procedural-based, and I could tell that I was somebody who was more procedural based, like I wanted to do something with my hands. And then I wanted to work with women because I'm just always an advocate for women. I'm a girl's girl. I've been a bridesmaid like 15 times by now, you know, and <laughs> there's movies I, about that. <laughs> I know. I, I, I've watched them. My mom's watched them. My dad's watched them. <laughs> but yeah, so I just always wanted to work with women. And then, honestly, I did my OBGYN rotation. I delivered a baby, and I knew. I was like, this is it. This is you it. were hooked. You were hooked from yeah. there. <laughs> exactly. So you're, from reading your bio, you're pretty young to be so accomplished already. What words of wisdom do you have for people that are trying to succeed at a young age? I really thank my parents for that. They mm -hmm. always pushed me and always taught me persistence. I always wanted to be a physician, but it's not like I was the smartest person that I've ever met. You know, I think hard work and dedication and really persistence. For instance, I took the MCAT twice. I, the first time I took it, which is, you know, the entrance test mm -hmm. to get into med medical school, I took it and my score was good enough to get into med school, but not as good as I wanted it to be, not where I wanted to go. And I remember even my college counselor at the time was like, just keep it. You'll get in. And I was like, well, but, you know, I really want to go to some better schools. And my mom was like, no, you can do better. If you want to do better, you can do better. Study harder, try harder. And that was kind of always the mentality that my parents had. I took it again. I did do better. I got in where I wanted to go. And so I think I've always been just taught that hard work and perseverance pays off. 
Mm-hmm. So you you primarily, or you said you have a penchant for working with a millennial population? Yes, is, for sure. And why is that? I mean, I'm on the cusp of millennial, I guess. You know, yeah. I'm right there. I'm, I was born in 1981. So it's still technically my generation. But I also feel like I relate well to the younger um, side of the millennial generation. I think it's a unique generation. I think it has unique problems. Um, and in terms of reproductive health, you're seeing unique problems that you didn't see in other generations. For instance, this is the first generation that is delaying childbirth, that is freezing eggs, that is kind of having these different considerations that we had, that our mothers had. There's obviously also a difference in the dating culture, sexual health. And so all of that I can relate to and really like to educate women about their health. Mm -hmm. I I always wonder about why people choose the professions that they're in, and there's usually a story behind it. When I was thinking about this interview, I was thinking about what I see in my office with women and teenagers, and I see a lot of people using birth control to help manage things like depression and anxiety, especially in the teenage population. And I'm just really curious about that. Do you have any thoughts on why they would do that? Or is it a hormonal issue? Does it help? Does it hurt? What do you know? So the only time that there's an actual benefit of being on birth control pills in terms of mental health is when you have something that is called PMDD or premenstrual dysphoric disorder, this is like PMS gone crazy, okay? And these people have a very specific symptoms about halfway through the month around the time after you ovulate up until, you know, your period and through your period, they have intense depression, intense anxiety where it's debilitating. Those people, we know if you put on birth control pills, it will help the same way as say an antidepressant would because they have a true hormonal imbalance that's leading to their symptoms. But if you are suffering from depression or anxiety throughout the month at different times, I don't necessarily think a birth control is going to make a difference. Again, it's tailored. You've got to kind of pick through where your symptoms are, but it's not first line treatment for depression or anxiety generalized. Mm -hmm. I I always felt bad for my husband because We had three women in the household at one time, all, uh, you know, having their cycles within a Mm -hmm. week of each other. (laughs) And I always felt like it was a little bit torturous for him. But how how do you know the difference between what is normal and what should be looked at as, as far as those symptoms go? It's all about how it's affecting your life. So most people have some sort of premenstrual symptom. They are fatigued. They might be irritable. They're a little bit more emotional. You want to eat a lot of chocolate and lay in your bed. That's normal. Where it's abnormal is where it starts interfering with your life, where you're so depressed or you're so anxious that you don't want to go to work. You don't want to go to school. You can't sleep. It's affecting your eating, where it's meeting true criteria for if you weren't in this time of the month that you'd be meeting criteria for real depression or real anxiety. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And do you do you have any suggestions for people outside of birth control? What can they do? So if you have true like premenstrual dysphoric disorder, like we're talking about birth control, but then also an antidepressant can also help. You can actually just also go on hormones in the latter part of the month as opposed to be on birth control every day because it's from a drop in your progesterone after you ovulate. Everyone has a drop. Some people, for some reason, are just very sensitive to it. And those are the people that are getting the PMDD and the anxiety symptoms in that time period. So you can also talk to your doctor about just taking progesterone replacement those those two weeks if you don't want to be on a birth control all the time. And then, of course, always with any sort of mental health illness, I recommend some sort of talk therapy. Oh, I thought you said shock therapy. I'm like, what? (laughs) Hold on a minute here. (laughs) Talk to somebody. Talk to somebody. (sighs) Okay. You scared me for just a second. (laughs) I I also think reducing sugar tends to help a lot of cramping and things like that that people struggle with. Yeah. So diet. Yeah. For regular just PMS symptoms, all of that stuff as well, like the reducing your sugar reducing caffeine and reducing alcohol, all of those around that time of the month. Magnesium Mm -hmm. helps. 
as well as a calcium supplement. Um, so those all help for, for PMS and then getting in the right amount of sleep also. That's something that's uh, quite elusive for people. It's easy to say, but hard to do. Exactly. Exactly. But if you're suffering from bad PMS or cramps around that time of month, it's even more important to try to get, to get rest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like all we're going to be doing is talking about a menstrual cycle. So I wonder how many male listeners we're going to lose today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, a lot of guys, you know, it's funny because when I started these endeavors of speaking publicly about these issues, at first you think, oh yeah, my audience is just women. And then there's so many guys that are like, oh, I read one of your articles. I listened to something that really helped me because my sister or my girlfriend, like you said, like your husband had three women in the house. So (laughs) it's interesting. It's sometimes, you know, men actually listen because they can relate to it from somebody significant in their life. (laughs) Right. Every, every time there's a mood related issue, that's what it gets, it gets blamed on in my house. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm going to shift the button a tad. For you guys, I've got a client whose wife is pregnant, and he's complaining. Uh-huh. By the way, I have no frame of reference. Most of my clients are men, so this is kind of out of my wheelhouse. I'm a female. I get it, but it's not my thing. So i got a client whose wife is pregnant, and he doesn't know what to do with the hormone rushes she's having. So how does one handle that if you're the spouse of somebody who's pregnant on her third month, and he's ready to throw her out the window? Oh, patience. I mean, I think what he's doing, if he's already talking to you about it, that's really the best thing that he can do. And of course, if, if it's getting really bad, some sort of family therapy, I don't think there's an, a cure all for a hormonal pregnant woman. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just chuckling over here because in my mind, I went, you know, just take a walk, run, get out yeah, of there, uh, I'm like, go get her what she her. wants. You know, <laughs> yeah, totally. Patience, Ice deep cream, breathing. Whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Take massages, care of <laughs> massages. But it's definitely a stressful time as people in general, as you know, when they're married, when they're trying to get pregnant while they're pregnant and those first couple of years after they have the baby really can, can test a relationship. Mm hmm. I think men are more apt to want to fix it than uh, mm-hmm. help themselves through it, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Is, but yeah, Kelly, is that what you I, think, too? Um, well, I mean, my clients come to me for addiction-related issues, so drugs, alcohol, escorts, blah, 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 gambling. <laughs> so um, I don't really know what to tell him because I've never been pregnant. I don't have kids. I don't work with women. So I'm like, well, I don't know. It's kind of there. <laughs> I completely identify with you. So I was trying to come up with ways to release his stress because she is right, right. unbearable and it's pretty bad. So it's a hard conversation because when you're hormonal and unbearable, like you don't want to hear somebody say you're unbearable. And I think it's your hormones. Right. Dr. It's Tara, you want to hear. I'm unbearable yeah. all the time and it's not because of my- <laughs> <laughs> Well, and then, you know, I can attest to that. <laughs> There's also the question of is what else is going on and what was the relationship like before the pregnancy? You know, it's like any sort of life stressor. It's going to test it. I don't know if we can just put the blame on the woman and say, oh, it's because she's pregnant and she's hormonal and she's crazy. I mean, there's likely something else (laughs) going on between them. Those situations tend to be complicated in my my experience. Is there something she can do or a supplement she can take to help her feel better? Because she's obviously uncomfortable. There's not really, yeah, there's not really a, a supplement. And again, I don't know her. I don't know where her struggle is coming from. I don't know if it's she feels tired. I don't know if it's because she feels, you know, heavy body image issues, pain. She could have complications with her pregnancy. And the list can go on and on. So it's hard to say what someone can do unless you know exactly what they're struggling from. But with that said, if it's just kind of a general, I feel overwhelmed and I feel stressed, I think kind of what you had recommended for him about getting out and taking a walk and things like that, I think taking time for herself just to kind of break away, whether that be like a nice massage or a day with her girlfriend, you know, something that's kind of me time to kind of get away maybe from the situation with her husband and then just kind of remember who she is. A lot of times people just are so anxious about 
the pregnancy that they forget about themselves. So just maybe some self care and social support. I think that's really helpful is talking to other moms that have been going through similar experiences can, can, can help. That's good advice. Do you think some of that, yeah, do you think some of that irritability can be what's called postpartum depression, but happening during pregnancy? So it's all about definitions, right? So postpartum Uh, depression is its own entity and it's not to be confused with what's going on in the, in the pregnancy. With that said, I think you bring up a good point. Like, is she irritable or does she have depression? And that's something she has to figure out with her doctor where she lies. And that's a really good point because she could actually have something going on like a major depressive disorder or anxiety, something more than just a regular, oh, I'm, I'm a little bit more emotional. So that's something to definitely, she should talk to her doctor about if she's really having issues that are interfering with her life. Mm -hmm. And then to go towards postpartum stuff, that's a different issue. So typically, once you have the baby, there's something that's normal, which is called postpartum blues, where people, not everybody, but a lot of people will experience a few days of kind of being tearful and anxious, and just kind of unsure. A lot of times they they worry about bonding with the baby, breastfeeding with the baby, those kind of things. That is still considered to be normal. If it's, you know, a couple, it lasts a couple of days to a couple of weeks. But when it goes beyond that, and it's something that's interfering with, again, your sleep, your eating, a lot of people get really apathetic, like they don't want to care for their baby, they have those types of feelings, well, then that's when you're categorized as postpartum depression. And that can be up up within the first year of after having a baby, which is important for people to know, too, because a lot of people, they had a baby six months ago, and they're feeling depressed, and they're like, oh, it can't be postpartum depression, that's not true. If you have um, like these major depressive symptoms within that first year, it's still considered postpartum depression. I actually had um, postpartum depression with both of my kids. Um, mm-hmm. the, the first, the first one was completely unrecognized, but it was really scary because I could relate to those women that wanted to hurt their children, their yeah. babies. Um, mm-hmm. It was so scary, but I talk very openly about it in my practice because it's not something we talk about mom guilt all the time. Well, you know, Mm -hmm. that plays a role in it. Like you literally want to hurt your child because you're feeling so helpless and defeated and just, yeah, it was a horrible time for me. So when I, and that was 23, 23, 24 years ago when I was pregnant that time. And then um, my son is 16. So when I was pregnant with him, they actually put me on an antidepressant because I started feeling the same way towards the mm-hmm. tail end of that pregnancy. So I was on an antidepressant for a little bit after he was born, um, mm-hmm. which I don't know. You know, I, I struggle with that too as a mom. Did I do the right thing? Didn't I? I don't, I have no idea. He seems fine. <laughs> if you need a therapy, <laughs> so he seems fine though. If you need therapy, I have like an hour to open. <laughs> oh, it sounds like to me that you, you don't work right with women. <laughs> I don't work with women. It sounds but, like yeah, you did the right thing. You could pay me to tell you <laughs> the wrong thing. I'll just tell you did the wrong thing. And then I'll send you a bill. No. <laughs> she just said I did the right thing for free, so I'll take her advice. Of course you <laughs> I will. think you did the right thing. I mean, I, first of all, I'm sorry that you experienced that. It's, it's really scary. And, and that's, very a, scary. you know, a very uh, common story, too, where first time goes unnoticed. Then somehow they kind of clue into, wait a minute, I had that last time I was mm-hmm. pregnant. And then luckily you're able to prepare for the next child a little bit better, but it sounds like you did the right thing. There's, you know, everyone always asks about antidepressants and pregnancy or with breastfeeding and, you know, there's a risk and benefit to everything, but especially in a situation like yours where you were actually having thoughts of hurting your baby and things like that, the benefit of taking it is much greater than the risk of not. So my mom guilt is kicking in over here. And I'm going, okay, my mm-hmm. babies, I do love you. <laughs> I'm, ha- I'm totally, having mom totally. guilt around love right now. <laughs> yes, exactly. But it, it wasn't until I think there was some news stories about women that were hurting their babies that after I had my first child that I was like, oh, my mm-hmm. God, that's what that was. You know, I really yeah. had I really had no clue what it was. So, yeah, I for the second time around. And, and I talked to my daughter about it too. I'm like, you know, this might happen to you. 
Um, yeah, I, exactly. I that's great. Mm-hmm. It's great mm-hmm. that you told her that because that's one of the things we always talk about is when you go in, even from the beginning for your first prenatal visit, you want to make sure that you're like disclosing everything in terms of any sort of your history, but also family history of mental illness because it, it does play a role. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. Now I'm going to fast forward a little bit into, I'm asking for a friend. Any tips on menopause? <laughs> for a so, friend. Uh, Hold on a sec. <laughs> for a friend. I'm asking for my friend, Callie. Is there any oh, tips on menopause? I'm not she's really hard menopause. to be around. <laughs> I'm still 29. With Anything besides a ceiling fan in the bedroom? <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, there's... <laughs> There is some, there's herbal stuff, and then obviously there's hormone replacement, right? And hormone replacement, again, that's something you're going to want to talk to your doctor about based on your symptoms, based on your uh, medical history. It's not right for everybody. It's another one that has risks. So if you want to try to go a more natural route, something that is really helpful is black cohosh. Have you heard about black cohosh? Yes, I have. Yep. Are you taking it? I mean, it? I think, I think my, no, because it's for my friend. Right. I think oh, my okay. friend is taking it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is your friend taking I, it? I, I believe my friend has taken it in the past, but didn't give it a fair shake. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It's one of those that you're going to need to take or your friend is, <laughs> your friend is going to need to take mm. over time and then okay. see how, see how they do. That's really the number. That's really the number one. There are some other ones that are out there like, you know, ginseng, um, evening primrose oil. Those are the more natural ones that people talk about. But black cohosh is the one that's the most most proven to help. Mm-hmm. All right. So I, I have a quick question off subject. And so we're mm-hmm. trying to ask everybody these questions. So what's the most badass thing you've ever done in your life? Oh, my gosh. In my life, I mean, yeah. I think I I think still some of the more scary type of obstetric situations where you know someone comes in and their baby's crashing and we have to do I have to do a C section oh. and get the baby out within a minute. Those kind of situations, although I don't want them, you know, I, those right. are not the ones you ask for. If they are afterward, you do feel like, wow, I just did something really cool and like saved. Pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. You just did something pretty awesome. I have another question for you. So I'm sure you've um, seen a lot of things and heard a lot of things. So what is the worst advice you've ever heard of that someone has come in and said, hey, they told me to do this. What's the worst, worst advice? Worst advice overall in general, I think are, I have a real kind of passion of speaking out against any of these things where people are putting things in their vagina. Like the, <laughs> glitter included. I, I'm sorry. <laughs> glitter included. Glitter included. Like glitter. Um, the jazzling. Have you heard about, yeah, all these weird things, steaming, vaginal steaming, all these weird things about putting (laughs) things in your vagina. I am totally against. It doesn't make any sense. It's ridiculous. I, though, that's the, that's the worst advice. We could have had a whole show on things that go in your vagina. (laughs) I've written articles about like five things to not put in your vagina and (laughs) that are common. That are common things that people are doing. It's crazy. It's really people crazy. People are putting common things in their vagina? What? Well, I'm saying there's common advice to put certain oh, things oh. in your vagina. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I got to know. Common- what are those top things? What are the, what, what was in the article besides glitter? Um, so, well, there was the glitter. Number one was like <laughs> vaginal steaming. What is that? That, did, did you, I don't even know what about that, that is. So it's, it was, it became popular like a few years ago because actually Gwyneth Paltrow like wrote about it on her website, but, and she was going to some place in Santa Monica where she was getting vaginal steaming. And it's basically where they shoot steam into your vagina. (laughs) And the idea is, it's ridiculous. The idea is to clean it out or something, which, okay, 
fine. Isn't but it self-cleaning, like a self-cleaning <laughs> oven? Self-cleaning, <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's a self-cleaning entity. And then, but also it's hot and you're, the inside of your vagina is like the inside of your mouth. Like it's sensitive. It's a mucous membrane. So you could get burned. It's really a bad idea. Are you talking you about get, the steam is hot or your vagina the is The steam hot? is hot. No, the steam, the is, steam hot. is hot. <laughs> So putting that into your vagina could really actually burn you, you know? And then the other thing is, so, and the other thing about the, the vaginal steaming is that they're also, people are saying, oh, it helps with like fertility. I'm like, how? It doesn't make any sense. Your vagina is a dead end. So like there's your cervix, which has like a, it doesn't make any sense. It's like your cervix that has like a pinpoint hole in it. But the idea that steam could go in through into that pinpoint into your uterus and then into your like out your fallopian tube and to do what it just doesn't it just does not make any physiological sense at all whatsoever oh my gosh i'm laughing so hard over here this is hilarious so <laughs> so that's another one think um, not to stick there's... in your vagina <laughs> Yeah, don't put that in your vagina. And then the other thing is tea tree oil. Have you heard about this? Yes, it burns. Another, oh, I know it. It, it burns. burns. It is. Exactly. Don't exactly. ask me tea how I do that. Burn. <laughs> Wait, well, I don't understand where it came from, though. Like, I don't, I don't know. Sally, what how do you know that? <laughs> okay, so I'm big on the yeah, oil in my bath. So I'll put eucalyptus in a bath and get in. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I put tea tree and I sat on it. It wasn't very comfortable. <laughs> oh, the last time I ever have, did that. Do you have to put milk on it to, uh, you know, like if you eat something spicy, like oh, something milk basic? It? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now we're sticking whipped cream in our vagina. This is nice. <laughs> Was that in your top list? <laughs> whipped cream Which in your vagina. Whipped cr- in the v- things to not put in your vagina. Whipped cream. Yeah. So anything real sugary. That's oh, another yeah. thing. Is like sugary oh lube. Like God. even like that. Like you're dying. I'm like this is like a daily topic for me now. So I'm like so <laughs> immune to it. But like even yeah. But anything sugary like sugar lubricant, chocolate sauce, anything like that can just <laughs> totally change the pH balance of your vagina, and then that'll lead to like yeast infections and bacterial vaginosis. Ew. And, so no yeah. chocolate pudding. No. This is no. my. Are you, you want to put on that food on the, list, Kelly? Yeah. No, Are you putting no together food list for Tim? <laughs> if you want to like lift donuts, that off of someone's donuts. arm or something, that's cool. But don't put it in your vagina. Do not put food in your. I needed this conversation twenty years ago, my dear. Because twenty years ago. <laughs> So, put food in there. This is, we needed to start the podcast with this conversation. So, I got to ask oh, this question. How do you have a serious conversation with a woman that's like 50 years old that comes in and sticks pudding up there? How do you have a serious conversation? Well, I mean, it's, you know, you, you know how it is. You go in, you're in your mode. It's, it's a straight face. It's a issue. It's a medical issue at that point. It's not really something. It's not jokes outside and sometimes you can not have a straight face and be like okay what were you doing you know <laughs> one thing that people do commonly like, is seriously uh, having... <laughs> huh? what i said like seriously just use the sugar-free pudding is that what you said God. yeah <laughs> oh no don't use any pudding but you know something else is huh, another common thing people do is when they have a yeast infection they try to do holistic stuff and one of the holistic things is Put yogurt in there. Actually, no. put yogurt in there. Yes, that's people do that. There goes Doctor Terry's do weekend plan. <laughs> Damn, I bought a bunch of yogurt. <laughs> I it's, can't believe. Well, that. and the idea, the idea behind it, I I get because basically, yogurt contains lactobacillus. Lactobacillus is a known good probiotic for your vagina, and if you take lactobacillus. You help maintain the pH balance of your vagina, and that will reduce your risk of yeast infections. But that is by mouth. <laughs> you know, you want to eat yogurt regularly or take a lactobacillus pill regularly if you are having, you know, frequent yeast infections to keep your pH balanced. But it doesn't mean once you get a yeast infection to put, you know, yogurt in there. It, it, it's something just gets mixed up in the 
it's like that kink game of telephone when you were little, you know, it's like someone whispered something and someone whispered something. And then all of a sudden someone's putting yogurt in their vagina. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Wait, oh my gosh! What playground was that on? I was on the wrong playground. I missed that one. <laughs> this is the adult one. This is the adult one. Oh my god! Oh, that is so funny. So the moral of the story is: food belongs in your mouth, not in your vagina hole. Yeah. <laughs> It's not that hard, people. It's not that difficult. <laughs> it's not. It's not. Oh, my gosh. That was hilarious. It, it, you know, the whole time, it wasn't about her vagina hole, but my daughter used to shove things up her nose. Like, she would pack mm. her nose full of, like, meat and stuff. She's going to kill me if she hears this. Anyway. Meat? But I, meat, yeah. <laughs> like, taco meat. Oh, my God. <laughs> That's a whole That's other so go for a whole <laughs> other day. But I'm thinking, I uh, wonder if anybody's done that. <laughs> so oh, I just Googled yeah. things not to stick in your vagina. And there's actually oh. an approved list of things that can go into your vagina on SheKnows.com. And number one is a penis. What? Imagine that. Oh, hey, yeah. I was going to say, did my name pop up? Because I feel like I've written or contributed to this type of article like at least 20 times by now. It's what to put, <laughs> what not to put. Oh my I suppose God. it's what's trending. What to put or not put in your vaginal hole is trending. Mm-hmm. How do people mm-hmm. not know this? I think because part of it too. <laughs> they're on, they're doing telephone, but <laughs> but I think also part of it is celebrity stuff. You know, in general, as you guys know, once a celebrity says something, then all of a sudden they're influencer and people are doing it. So, for instance, the Gwyneth Paltrow thing that was vaginal steaming. And then at some point, Khloe Kardashian, I remember, was talking about putting vitamin E in her vagina <laughs> and that she was doing that for strengthening it. And vitamin E is not something that's going to be harmful at, at all. It's just a lubricant and a moisturizer, but it's not necessary. It's not, and it's not going to make your vagina so much stronger. You know, but I think that's part of it too is just nowadays, everyone is an expert. So you can go online, you can say something. And if you have enough people listening to you, it catches on. Well, I mean, seriously, if, if, if there aren't any medical concerns, do we really need to like make our vaginas stronger as if we, you know, like do crunches or kegels or whatever? Yeah. Do we really need to do that? I mean, is that something that is absolutely a necessary thing to do? I don't, I, I do promote doing that even throughout your life to strengthen those muscles for a few reasons. I think it does help for, with your sex life and for a woman to be able to have a fulfilling, I don't know how bold I can be on this show. (laughs) You can be bold. We've already talked about vagina holes. You could be as bold. (laughs) I know, I know, I know. Okay, I was going to say it does help if you can strengthen those muscles and kind of learn how to, use them, I do feel like it can help you for women achieve orgasm. So that's important, especially if there's someone who has difficulty doing so. I think it also helps with main, like maintaining those muscles when you carry a child, when you have, when you go through childbirth, there is something that you may know that later in life, some women experience something that's called prolapse, where they start to have kind of herniation of either their bladder or their uterus or, or their bowel that kind of comes through the vagina after having children, multiple children, heavy children. If you, again, it's not, if you do this, you definitely won't have this. Or if you do, don't do this, you definitely will have this. But we do think that strengthening your pelvic floor, either through Kegels or even like Pilates yoga can help prevent having prolapse later in life. You hear that, Dr. Tara? I do yoga, I do Pilates, and I strengthen my (laughs) JJ. You know what that means? I'll be swinging Apparently. through the raptors later. <laughs> With your pudding. And With my yogurt. chocolate pudding and my glitter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Apparently, I'm going to the yoga studio tonight, folks. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely All right. fun, and we are so out of time. It's ridiculous. But I want to thank you for coming on and let our listeners thank know you. where to find you. So if I have a website, it's drperry.com, 
uh, D-O-C-T-O-R-P-A-R-I.com. And from there, you can really just link to my Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and that's how you find me. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for coming on. And you're listening to Unpause Your Life with Dr. Kelly Estes and Dr. Tara Lynn Sell. And one of us is going to be having good sex later. Have a good day, guys. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thanks again for listening. I really hope you enjoyed the show today. Head on over to iTunes and Apple Podcasts and leave a comment or review of what you think. Or contact us at 1 800 706 0318. If you want to be on our show, feel free to email or call. And if you have a topic, feel free to email or call as well. Thanks for listening to Unpause Your Life. For show notes and more, head on over to unpauseyourlife.com. Big shout out to recoveryinnovators.com for help producing this show. Thank you, guys. Took a walk down the long road The weather said that I shouldn't go On my way found a reason To wake up another day But they needed to show you All the things that you won't do Find faith or religion But nothing Give me